Hi, this is Shreya and welcome to the part 1 of performing a molecular dynamics simulation in Python. Um, so, we are going to take a bunch of argon particles, initialize them to some configuration and study how they interact with each other. So, our objective is to find the trajectory of all these particles and um, we'll calculate what the final configuration of those particles will be. So, uh, these particles, they'll interact with each other with some forces and then they'll push or pull each other and then they'll end up in some configuration after some time t. They'll continue interacting but we'll only, um, we'll only simulate it for some particular time. So now, first of all, why did we choose argon out of all the uh, atoms or molecules? So we could have chosen things like oxygen or nitrogen, but the reason we chose argon is that argon is a noble gas. That means it doesn't form molecules. It always stays in its atom form. And that enables us to assume argon as point particles, and which makes the compute calculations a whole lot easier. So say we had chosen oxygen. So oxygen exists in its gas form as O2, which is two oxygen atoms bonded together. And that would make uh, calculate, like finding out the interactions between them and analyzing them um, fairly complicated. And argon simplifies it by a lot. And we could do oxygen too, but it's just that it will become uh, far more complicated and I want to do a very basic molecular dynamic simulation here. Yeah. So now, how exactly do we calculate the trajectories? So by trajectories, we are only interested in the positions of the argon particles at all times. So, one thing you need to keep in mind is compute, a computer's ability to calculate stuff is limited, right? So, we, so the uh, time interval after which we calculate, say, the next set of positions will be some finite value. Like, ideally, it should be as close to zero as possible. But in our case, it will have some finite value, say like uh, 10 raised to minus 6 seconds or 10 raised to minus 8 seconds. Because we, we, the uh, lesser the time interval is, the more accurate our simulation will be. But at the same time, it will be more computationally costly. So yeah, keep that in mind that dt is that time step we're considering. Um, so what our objective is, uh, we want to update the positions of our argon atoms after every dt time for some 1000 to 1000 steps or whatever. So how we'll do that? Say um, we have positions and velocities of all the particles at one particular instant. So now we need to calculate the positions for the next instant, right? And we know that change in position of say particle 1 will be the velocity of particle 1 at the current instant into our dt. So yeah, we'll get the position of particle 1 at for the next instant and similarly for all the particles. So uh, now we have, let's say this is uh, instant number 1, we have the uh, positions and the velocities. Now at instant number 2, we have the positions. But now, uh, to calculate the positions for instant number 3, we don't have the velocities here. So somehow, we need to calculate the velocities too, so that we're able to find out the positions at instant number 3. So how will we calculate the velocities? We know that the change in velocity of the particle 1 it will be equal to its acceleration into dt. And acceleration is equal to F, a force upon mass. What kind of forces will be there? First of all, we need to understand that. So, argon atoms will always be neutral. They won't have a net positive or net negative charge in them. So, Coulombic interactions is out of the picture. 
So the only interactions you need to consider are wander wall interactions and poly repulsion. And if you haven't heard of these before, they are basically a result of the fact that the electrons and protons don't lie at exactly the same point, right? The electrons revolve around the nucleus and hence there's some gap between them, sort of. So this gives rise to some attraction and repulsion between the atoms. And uh, we can calculate that. So the expression for the potential energy between two uh, particles is this expression. It's called the Leonard Jones potential energy. So uh, I'll tell you what epsilon and sigma mean in this expression. Uh, but obviously r is the distance between the two particles. And if we have the expression for potential energy, then we can differentiate it and take the negative of it to find the force. Uh, just keep in mind that epsilon and sigma are constants. So yeah, uh, if we differentiate this, we get uh, this expression. But now, just keep in mind that energy was a scalar, but force is not. Force has to have a direction. And um, so this expression is for the force on particle 1 due to particle 2. And this is the direction which the force is. This cap represents a unit vector. So this has magnitude 1. And this is the magnitude of uh, the actual force that was obtained by differentiation. So uh, first of all, let's clear up why we took R1 minus R2 as the direction and not R2 minus R1. So that's because we're calculating the force on particle 1. And uh, so R1 minus R2 is this direction, okay. Uh, so let's say this expression is positive. And what positive force means in our case is that uh, the particles are repelling each other. So by repulsion, uh, um, so repulsion implies that particle 2 is pushing particle 1 in this direction. Hence, um, the direction will be the same as this direction. The direction of the force will be the same as this direction. But say if it's negative, that means a repulsion, uh, an attraction between two particles is taking place. So particle 2 will pull particle 1 in this direction. So the direction of the force is opposite of this, hence the negative magnitude. And so yeah, that explains why this is R1 minus R2. So at any point, if you feel confused, just pause and ponder for a while because all of this is like, uh, this is really basic stuff. You just need to have a little bit of physics knowledge about like how differentiating energy and taking the negative gives the force and like say what Coulombic interactions are and stuff like that. So yeah, let's just look, look at this potential energy graph. So this is the potential energy and this is the distance between the two particles. So yeah, now here sigma and epsilon come into picture. So sigma is the distance between the two particles at which the potential energy goes to zero. Uh, and that's like a pretty unique distance, right? That's of importance. We define that as, as sigma. And uh, Epsilon is the depth of this um, uh, potential energy curve. So keep in mind that even though sigma and epsilon are constants, they are constants for a particular type of atoms, uh, for a particular type of atom pair. Like um, argon-argon atom pair will have a particular value for sigma and epsilon. But say argon and, uh, argon and helium will have a different value for sigma and epsilon. Um, which makes sense intuitively, like why would argon and helium have the same distance as argon and argon at which the potential energy drops to zero? It all depends on the configuration of electrons and protons, right? So let's try and make some sense to why this potential energy graph looks like this. So like, why does it go to infinity as the distance goes to zero? And why does it have a minima? And why does it approach zero as the distance goes to infinity. So, uh, 
it approaching zero as the distance goes to infinity is pretty self explanatory because if you increase the distance and if you increase it like a lot there won't there will be like negligible interaction between them so there will be sort of no potential energy so that's why it approaches zero and um, why does it approach infinity uh, as the dis- distance goes to zero is because if you bring the new uh, if you bring the protons like really close and the electrons really close then the, there would be like extreme repulsion between them and they would just want to fly apart so that's why the potential energy goes to positive infinity and there will be like extreme repulsion here it's a really unstable state but as you start bringing it uh, far away then the potential energy starts reducing because i mean it doesn't want to fly apart so badly now it's becoming more and more stable and this is like the epitome of stableness that the pair of atoms will ever achieve because this is the perfect distance between them so at this point there is no repulsion and no attraction between them it's just you know happy there but and but from here it will start attracting it uh, it will the particles will start attracting each other because like as we know everything wants to reduce its potential energy so while the potential energy in is in this part it will try to reduce it to the minima and while it's in this part it will still try to reduce it to the minima here by repelling and here by attracting so yeah i guess that's all of the theory there is behind this uh, molecular dynamics simulation and i have already run it so i'll show you what you are going to expect what you are supposed to expect so this is all the code that i needed from here to here for performing the simulation which is pretty short so this is the initial configuration of the argon atoms and uh, this is the configuration of the atoms after uh, in my case i've put 2000 steps of time interval 001 a point uh, 001 so yeah these will like ideally these will continue interacting forever but i mean obviously we have to set some finite number of time steps uh so by the way the software i'm using is called jupiter notebook and the entire thing is in python um uh, so download the software because it's uh, really useful for such kind of um projects because you can execute the code block by block which is really useful for uh plotting and all and uh, even if you don't know Py- if you know python well and good you know you'll understand you'll 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 have a really easy time understanding all this but if you don't know python it's all right because python is like a very close to english language and um, i'll explain stuff along the way so you won't have problem understanding all of this code it might seem intimidating as of now but as we code it up it won't be that hard and so from the next video we'll start um, actually coding it up so goodbye for now